But praise the Lord, he did. And we have everlasting life uh, because of it. Uh, if you have your Bibles, you can be uh, turning to Hebrews chapter 12. And while you're turning there, just a reminder, we will be observing the Lord's Supper on Wednesday night. And I had hoped to wait a week closer to April 12th, uh, excuse me, to April 15th. But I thought it very appropriate that Sarah and Adam um, be able to observe the Lord's Supper uh, one time uh, more before they go south. And uh, it's about as close as we can get to the 15th of uh, April. I think it's interesting that that's very close to the day of the resurrection. And it's also when our taxes are due every year. <laughs> I don't know how the United States came up with that, but uh, it, it is interesting to know. Uh, Hebrews chapter 12, and we're going to begin reading in the very first verse. Hebrews chapter 12, in the very first verse, the Bible says, Wherefore, seeing we are also compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of God, at the throne of God. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you uh, for this great book, Lord, we thank you that uh, you made it available in a language that we can understand, Lord, in a language that uh, is unique to English-speaking people. God, we pray tonight, this morning, that you would uh, bless it to the hearts of the hearers, Lord, that uh, you would stir us up in your service for you, and we'd be faithful to give you the praise and the glory and the honor for it all. For it is in Christ's name we do pray. Amen. Now, as an aside, uh, I want y'all to always cherish the King James Bible. Never in my life of 55 years have I ever seen it under more attack than it is right now. And I'm not talking about attack out there. I'm talking about attack in the Lord's churches. Yeah. Um, I might read a commentary occasionally. I don't do a whole lot of that, to be honest. Uh, just to get maybe some other ideas, but the, the emphasis today among supposedly sound brethren is get a, a whole rapport from the uh, NIV and the ESV and, and get a general idea of what the Scripture is saying. I don't believe that. If I believed that, I would use whatever Bible that I chose to use. And you know the scary part, and again, I'm not talking about secular churches. I'm talking about our kind of churches. That's the decision they're making. And uh, always take the full counsel of God. So back in Hebrews chapter 12 in the first verse, and you all know my opinion of the church letter to the church at Jerusalem. I feel like it is written by Paul, but he does not take credit for it. But it is not a letter to Jewish people, it is to a Jewish church. Because all the time and again and again, the writer reminds them of faith and grace. Uh, he does not really, he kind of puts the law in its place, but he does not emphasize the law. So it was not to the Jewish people as a nation, it was to the Jewish church, which was at Jerusalem. And that's who this group is addressing. So uh, referring back to chapter 11, he says, Wherefore, seeing we are compassed so by, uh, by a great cloud of witnesses, all the way from the days of Noah down to the days of Christ, and he picked out men of God that had a great faith in God. Now, only you can measure your own faith. And the emphasis of this story, I mean, this message this morning, is really found in the second verse, what are you looking at? Have you ever thought about how what you're seeing, how it impacts your life, how it can gnaw you to the things of the, that are happening in the world around you? 
And you know what? If you see people running around, women running around in, a br in britches enough, you'll eventually get okay with that because you're continuing. You know, uh, I think the Bible says in, in the Gospel of Matthew, having their consciousness seared with a hot iron. That hot iron is what the world is doing to us. Amen. So when you see an image, at the very best, it is shaped by what you already have seen. So when we look at something, when we see it, we need to be seeing it in the light of Scripture. What are you looking at? What you're looking at physically can impact you greatly. Amen. We need to be careful of that, don't you say? We need to, we need to be careful of what we see on TV and, and what, we, what we see as we read. We need to be very... The vision is the most complex and the most defining feature of all the senses known to man. Uh, what you see... You know, the old saying goes, a picture's worth a thousand words. When you're trying to describe a house that you've been in, but rather you have pictures in it of a house, which is the better? And the very same with us, we have to look very careful, or we have to be very careful of what we look upon. So what Paul had done, or whomever the writer is, is remind them this great story of faith. Now, what's the difference between faith and sight? With faith, you just have to believe. You know what? I've never seen the Lord Jesus Christ, but I know He's real. Can you picture grace? Not really. Grace is a concept, isn't it? The unmerited favor of God. You can't behold grace, but I believe it. So what are you looking at? What we look at has a huge impact on what we do and really who we are. Looking at things should not be taken lightly. Viewing things that are set before you should be a careful endeavor, but many times today in the modern day, it's not. So it's just we have these huge people, this vast amount of people that acted not by sight, but by faith. When Noah was informed by the Almighty, hey Noah, it's going to rain and you need to build an ark. You know what Noah did do? Well, Lord, what's rain? He'd never seen it. He'd never heard about it. But he had faith it was coming. And it was such a strong faith that he worked on a project for 127 years and was made fun of it the whole time that he was doing it. That's faith. It defines who you are. And so we see, he begins, we're foreseeing we are compassed with about, so, about with so great a cloud of witnesses. Let us, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doeth so easily beset us. Now, I want you to see that conjunction in there, weight and sin. They're not the same thing. They're not synonymous. He wasn't talking about the same problem. He was talking about two problems. The weight that we carry around and the sin that drags us down. You know what your weight is? A lot of times us men, and you know what? We were cursed with it in Adam. It's just making ends meet. That's a weight, is it not? And you get stressed out about it, right? When you get a grim report from the doctor, that's a weight. It's going to bring you down. It's going to slow you down. And you're not going to serve as well as before. And then on top of that, many of us, well, really all of us, have sin in our lives. And he says, church, Jerusalem, lay it down. Get rid of it. And you think about the church at Jerusalem, they were very works motivated because that's all they ever know. And so I don't think this church was so laden with sin as we think about it. You know, uh, uh, whoremongers and whores and, 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 and men and men run together. I don't think that was the church's problem. I think they were so worried about works that that's all they could get around. And, and so he says, you lay that aside. That's too much.
much of a burden. Uh, the law is dead. Don't take that up again. And the reason why is so we can serve him better. Also, I want you to see these things, uh, both these things, weights and sins, beset us. Being beset is like being hunted. Have you ever uh, been out in the woods and you hear that, that little bit of a rattle? You know what? It's already too late. Only thing you can do is be very still at that point. Because you know what? He's going to bite you if you make a run for it. He's going to beset you. Now, picking more than once in, this, in my life, this is half my grandmother told me this. Larry, if you're picking berries and you smell cucumbers, you get out of there. And because you know copperheads close, right? <laughs> and so far, I've been very. She scared me enough. I still do it today, and that's that over 50 years ago. <laughs> it beset me. I didn't know the copperhead was there. It besets us. And so, a lot of times, these weights and these sins, the only thing I come to, we don't even know they're there. And we have to set them aside. We have to get rid of them when they're identified by the Holy Ghost, when he says, you got this problem, let it go. Set it aside so you can run with me. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Now, patience is a difficult thing to have. Hopefully, it grows with time. I've seen a little of that in my life, but not a whole lot. Patience. You know, when the Lord first saved me, I was ready, ready for Him to come that very day. That's been 30, 39 years ago. 40, no, 42 years ago. I'm still trying to ruin patience. 42 years is a long, long time. So, the only way to grow patience, and this is not, this is not uh, pew walking news for the young people with me, the only way to grow patience is time. We like to hurry things along, don't we? We like, we like to move things forward very quickly. But here we find that Paul, or whoever the writer is, gives us the advice to run with patience. Do you ever run anywhere? I mean, really took off and run? Um, I have. And the best thing to do is go at a steady pace. If you take off really quick, you're going to run out of juice really quick. So just run with patience. That's really the concept of jogging is what we call it in the modern day. Just run steady. Just, just, run, just run routinely. You, you don't have to, you don't have to uh, run like the wind. Just be patient. Just, just continue on. And, and that is uh, the writer's concept that he gives to the church of Jerusalem. How are you going to do this? Looking on to Jesus. What are you looking at? A horrible tragedy in Baltimore. You've been looking at that? I think we all have to some point. And I've tried to pray for the families. That's all I know to do. The, those, those individuals are dead now. I can't do nothing for them. I pray for the family. I find some level of comfort. Pray for the, and a lot of people never think about this. Pray for the, the guy that was driving the ship. If he truly didn't mean to do it, can you imagine living with that? Do you ever wonder what he was looking at? Now, the way I understand it, if it's true, you know, anymore you can't believe the news. One Walter Conkright is dead. Uh, if he truly, if, if he truly didn't know, did he take, did he take his mind off? Of, did, he, did he look away from the bridge for a minute? 
Anybody ever have a rack? I have. I've had multiple racks actually. Uh, was it because I took my eye uh, off the road for a minute? Looking unto Jesus. So if we're not looking at all this trash going on around us, what keeps us on the right road, you know, the Bible says there's a narrow way that leadeth unto life. If we keep our eyes on Jesus, that's the direction we'll go in. That, that's the direction we'll stay. But we'll find from the scriptures that that isn't an easy thing to do. With all the glamour of the world and it's getting more shiny and the money and the things going all around us, sometimes keeping your eye on Christ gets very, very, very hard to do. I have a cousin. She is a die-hard Democrat. And she, uh, uh, and I didn't say nothing. Y'all would have been proud of me. Uh, she put on Facebook, there's more people employed and all this about it. And I thought, well, I want to say, well, cousin, when a roast is 30 bucks a, a, a piece, it doesn't matter how much you're earning, does it? But I did. And I, I was like, Larry, you held your tongue. That's a step in the right direction. But do you want to see what I'm saying? It's easy to look at that stuff. <coughs> you know, uh, when you uh, about to the point, you're like, well, I guess we just won't have me that ever be one anymore. That's how I was ready. So maybe that's the direction we go back in. Kind of gets discouraging, don't it? <laughs> Looking unto Christ. And, and so we see then that the modern day church, the, the church of 2024, we need to implement this more and more and more. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. The things we can't see. The promises with, that have not occurred yet. I will return again. I will come back in, in the sky. I will bring you into myself. Those things we've not yet seen. The author and the finisher of our faith. <laughs> For the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame. He did not enjoy that. Remember, he says, Father, if it thy will, this cup be passed forth from me. Now, remember when he said that, I do not believe he was talking about the death of the cross. I really don't. I think he was talking about the event where that he would be separated from the Father. And he would be separated from the Father. The Father would turn his back on him. Why? Because of my sin. And we need, we need to take ownership of that. You know what? If I had been the only elect that ever lived, it would have been the same amount of sin, right? He didn't die more for me than he did for you. If you're saved, he died for you, right? The author and the finisher of our faith. And, and so we see, the way I take this, sometimes we have to keep our eye when the circumstance is not going too well. You know what, I'm sure, you remember the Lord Jesus Christ when at the, at the mock trial that he had? Right before that, when they came to arrest him, they, he said, who seek you? And remember, it knocked him down. And then he stood in the court of Pilate and never said a word. Did you ever wonder the reason he didn't? If he did, he'd have knocked them down too. Only one thing they said. Art thou the son of God? That was said. Modern day language would be, you said it. <laughs> right? And so with that, that power that was with him, that strength that was with him, he chose to die anyway. He elected to do that on our behalf. And, and, and it ought to be that our whole faith is in that event. 
For consider him, verse 3, for consider him that endured such contradiction of the sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied and faint in your minds. Now, if you write in your Bible, underline that. If you be wearied and faint in your minds. You know what, church? You're going to be wearied. There are going to be events that transpire that you'll say, I'm done, I'm quit, I cannot do this anymore. You know what? Just keep going. If you get to that point, you know what the issue is? You're not looking unto Christ, and you took and you've not let that burden hit the floor lately. Right? You're wagging it around like a like trying to swim with a bag of concrete on your back. We, we, we don't need that. In fact, it, it's an impossibility. So we as the Lord's people, we need to lay that down and, and not let it consume who we are. Ye have not resisted into the blood, striving against sin, and ye have forgotten that, that exhortation which speaketh unto you as unto children, my son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, nor faint when thou art rebuked of him. Now we get to a part we, necess we don't necessarily like. If you keep wagging them around, you're going to get a whipping. Put them down. Keep your eyes on Christ. You ever call someone out of the ground? Can be a little, can be a little scared, can you? Surprisingly, you talk about Matthew David. He was my worst pupil. He scared me to death. You talk about some prayer time. I haven't done that all yet, but it's coming. My bookworm was the best driver I had. I thought this is gonna be this is gonna be rough. Got in the car, he backed it out. We drove up to the store and drove home. He said, What do you think, Dad? I said, I think you're ready. <laughs> that that's how easy it was. You just don't know to do. And so the very same way you <coughs> have to be corrected. Matthew was so bad we got pulled over, and I'm not making that up. Just not. And so sometimes children have to be corrected, don't they? <laughs> Look at yourself. You know what the best way to keep from being corrected is keep yourself in line. Yeah. Right? Keep your eyes on Christ. Look unto Him constantly. And you can avoid the rebuke that comes with not looking at Him and picking up those ungodly burdens that we have no, no reason to walk around with anymore. Now go with me very quickly back to the Gospel of Mark and we're going to see some things that you ought to keep your eyes on instead of all the muck and mess that's happened around us. Mark chapter 9 uh, beginning in verse 1. Mark 9 uh, beginning in verse 1. And he said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that there be some of them that stand here which shall not taste death till they have seen the kingdom of God with power. Now, that's kind of really, I think, and I'm not a King James translator, so I did, it probably should have maybe been left with the other chapter because they were talking about the kingdom of God. And, and listen, the kingdom of God and the, the age of God, his earthly kingdom, New Jerusalem, are two different things. He wasn't lying to his people here. You know what? The first time someone was by, saved by grace, the kingdom of God began. That's what he's talking about. And, and so he wasn't lying when he said, on this rock I build my church. 
That's part of the kingdom of God. It's the redeemed. And so don't ever let that one throw you off because people like Jehovah's Witnesses will jump in on that uh, uh, with two feet. And if you don't know your Bible, they'll, they'll trick you up. So now verse 2, and after six days, Jesus taketh with him Peter and, J uh, Peter and James and John and leadeth them up into a high mountain apart by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his raiment became shining exceedingly white as the sun, so as no fuller on this earth can wipe them. And there appeared unto him Elias and Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. And Peter answered and said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles. Three tabernacles, one for thee, one for Moses, and one for Elias. For he wished not what to say, and, and they were sore afraid. Now, I want you to notice in that verse, the part where it says they didn't know what to do. They, they, they had no clue. You know what the best thing that you can do when you don't have a clue? It just sit there and keep your mouth shut. But Peter, being a loud mouth, and, and Peter with a, with a quick, sharp tongue, said, Oh, I know what we can do. We can build some more tabernacles. See, what he'd seen was a little overwhelming, wasn't it? Don't, uh, don't do something with... You know what? When people are healed by divine healing, it can be overwhelming. I've seen it. I, I think it's happening even as, as, as we speak in Sister Dina's life. And, and not overwhelming in the, in the sense that it, it, it's hard, but it's amazing. And that's the thing, the most thing you could do possibly is give God the praise for it. Amen. That's it. Amen. Because if we put any more than that to it, we'll be back out in the deep water uh, where Peter was, and we don't want to be there. And suddenly, verse 8, when they had looked round about him, they saw no man any more save Jesus only with themselves. And as they came down the mountain, he charged them that they should tell no man what things they had seen till the Son of Man was risen from the dead. So we see one thing that we could keep our eyes on, that we could look unto, look unto, is Jesus as God. You know, most religions, and I use that word loosely, most Christian groups, if you want to call them, they don't look at Christ as God. They simply look at Christ as subservient to God. They, they, look, at, they look at Christ as being lesser than God. He is not. They're, they're all equal persons of the Godhead, are they not? Remember the eternity of the the eternality of Christ? Remember in the days of Daniel and the old king of Daniel there, and I see and he said, I see four men. One likened unto the Son of God. He was around then. Yeah. And so we see one thing in the hard spots. Look unto Christ. We need that. We need more of that. If ever there was a day uh, in, in the history of man, looking unto Christ has become paramount. Otherwise, we would be huh, to, the, to the point of quitting. The Gospel of John. Very familiar verses of Scripture. John 1. John 1, verse... Uh, 36. John 1, verse 36. Speaking of John the Baptist. And looking upon Jesus as he walked, he saith, Behold the Lamb of God. Again, all the attention drawn unto Christ. In this very same excerpt, he says, He must increase, and I must decrease. That was looking on to Christ. Lost person, I'm pointing you to Christ. That is my only thing that I can do for you. He's a Savior. He's a friend. He's the one that can make your soul new and wonderful again. 
again, that is Christ. You know what? The, the rich fullness of looking on Christ, lost people and saved people both can do it. Look unto Christ. You know, there, there's nothing quite as fulfilling. There, there, there's nothing quite as wonderful as beholding Christ and His holiness and seeing that He is the answer for sin. Look unto Christ. Keep Him in your scope. Make his life the guidance for your own. You know what? Every time I've got out of the will of the Lord, it's been my fault. It hasn't been Christ. It's because I got my eyes off him and got my eyes on Larry. And, it, and, and, and the result is always catastrophic. That's why I said in Hebrews, I'll give you a weapon if I need to. Keep your eyes on Christ. Focus in on Him. And I think a lot of us keep our eyes on Christ to some extent, but our focus is not that good. Now, when I take my glasses off, I know where each of you are at because I know where you're sitting. But if somebody pointed to somebody, if I didn't know where you were at, your location, I couldn't probably even, I probably could identify my wife, and that's it. And very same thing with us sometimes. We take off our spiritual glasses, and we know he's out there somewhere, but we can't focus in, right? We need to be having a good vision of Christ in these last days. Acts chapter 7. Acts 7 and verse 55, the death of Stephen. You ever think about death? If you don't now, you will when you get over it. You know, one of my biggest fears, and it is fear, and you know why I got fearful? Because I took my eyes off Christ. But one of my biggest concerns when when Bella came into our life was me living because she was grown. I'm 44 years older than Bella. That, that was one of my concerns because what? You know what? She needs both parents in her life, at least till she's an adult, right? You know why I had those concerns? I took my mind, I took my eyes off Christ. You know what? If she was provided, my Lord is sufficient. You know, Aaron's, uh, I mean, uh, Abraham and Sarah didn't get the hummy drummies because they were 109, and one of them was 100 and one of them was 90. They rejoiced. They rejoiced exceedingly at the birth of their son. And so we see then, we don't need to take our eyes on Christ, off Christ. But the reality is this, death is coming. Death is a certainty. If the Lord Jesus Christ doesn't come in, 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 in my lifetime, I'm basing it one way or the other, right? Yeah. That's a very much a reality to me. You think when Stephen walked on that plane, I don't mean the airplane, that flat spot where they were at, do you think he had any idea that would be his last sermon? I don't believe he planned for this. I don't believe he thought, you know what? These Jews are going to get so mad at me, they're going to kill me. I don't think it ever occurred to him. So what was it then? It was a surprise. Death can be a huge surprise, can it? It, it, it can take you off your feet. Someone you love suddenly here one day and gone the next. I told y'all about my, my 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 best friend growing up. He was coming down to see me and Donna, and his wife was with him. They had a rescue with Almira, and he went out to eternity. I so didn't believe it when his sister-in-law called me and said, "Hey, Steve is dead." I didn't believe her. He was 24 years old out in eternity. 
See, we have it all blocked off and planned, don't we? But the reality is we don't know. Stephen walked on that day to tell the Jews what their problem was and he never came back uh, as a living man. And so we, we see in, in this really horrible state in Acts 7 verse 55, but he being, meaning Stephen, being full of the Holy Ghost. You know what? That's what I want when I leave this place. I want to be full of the Holy Ghost. And he says, looking unto heaven, he said, I see Jesus standing at the right hand of the Father. You know what? If he had been full of the Holy Ghost, I don't believe he'd have seen nothing that day. You want good vision like these glasses? You know what your glasses are? The person of the Holy Ghost. And if he ain't around, you're just as blind as a bat. Where are you at this morning? What, what are you seeing? Are you seeing an end time prophecy fulfilled before your eyes? Are you seeing your children uh, loving the Lord like you do? Uh -huh. what, what, what are you seeing? And th th this is the reality of it. And we always have to consider this, right? What do you want to see? I think a lot of us want to see the best in people, don't we? But what, what, what is the best? Seeing what's there or seeing the best in people? There's a, a fellow at the nursing home. He's supposed to come back yesterday, but uh, I don't know what they did. I left, um, well, that's Friday. Excuse me. And um, first time I saw this little spot on his head, and I said, that's cancer. And we went through all the medical hoops trying to get the man the help that he needed. But what we didn't know this was the tip of the iceberg. Everything else was in, was in here. It was already too late. He's a good man. He asked me, he said, Larry, what do you think? I always start my statements with this. I'm not a doctor, but nurses have to do that. And I just told him, I said, Mr. Truman, it looks like cancer. What else can I say to him? You know what? He needed a clear look, did he not? I could have said, well, for a minute, it looks like we're a mosquito stitch. But would that have been the benefit he needed? He needed to hear the truth. And then later we noticed he had a mirror in there doing like that. He wanted to look on it himself, you see. We need to look at ourselves in lieu of Christ. Let Christ be your mirror and you look on yourself. We need that desperately in the last day. So in his death, we find Stephen looking and seeing Christ. What could be better? What could get you through a hard, a hard spot? Even what could get you with facing death directly except looking unto Christ? Now that I've depressed you beyond depression, look with me in the little book of Titus. <clears throat> Titus chapter 2, we're just going to read one verse for time's sake. Titus chapter 2 and verse 13. Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Do you, do you look unto him like he's coming? You know, sometimes I think we say we do and we really don't. Me and Donna's house face the east. That morning sun is crude is crude sometime on our house. It's hot. But when I look out my bedroom window, 
I'm looking to the east. Do I look up there with anticipation? Say, hey, you know what? This could be the day. This could be it. I might be home with the Lord before the sun falls. Sometimes I do. Being real honest with you, sometimes I don't. Sometimes I look at that, man, the sun's up. I'm probably late for work. <laughs> right? Looking unto Jesus. Do you do that? Do you see him? Is your life trouble? Are you having difficulty? Put that burden down and just look unto Christ. You know what? That burden was paid at the cross of Calvary. Put it down. There's no need for you to wag it around and let it, let it bring you down spiritually. Now, we read that the advice of the race was just to be consistent. You don't have to run like a dog, run it with patience. So put the burden down and just get to it. 